Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon to all the classes joining us from all over the world in different time zones. My name is Jordan. I work here at National Geographic Education in Washington, D.C. I'm so happy that all of you could join this hangout today to celebrate World Ocean Day. Um, awesome that we have Christina Zanato here with us for this 10 a.m. session. She's a diver and a cave explorer and does a lot of work with National Geographic in the Bahamas with the blue zones and the blue holes. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Jordan. Good morning. Yeah. So go ahead whenever you want. We're eager to hear and see all that you have to share. Very good. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. I'm going to start right away with a screen sh share screen so they can start a little bit about myself through the images. Now, very good on the water. Let's see with technology. I just did share screen. Here we go. And how is this? Looks good to me. Very good. Welcome to my shark centric, my world of sharks and my passion. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Italy. I've been in the Bahamas for the last 23 years. And my passion is inherited from uh, family. This is my dad in one of his uh, pictures from the 1950s. And he was a special force unit. And I grew up with these pictures and this idea of uh, basically the fact that 20,000 leagues under the sea existed. Because my dad was one of those people that went 20,000 leagues under the sea, at least in my imagination. And so I always wanted to become a diver. And 23 years ago, I had the opportunity to come on vacation to the Bahamas, and I decided actually to stay and make the Bahamas my home and dive in my life. And this is to this day what I still do. Uh, one of my first early mentors and greatest inspiration, his name is Ben Rose, also known as Uncle Ben. Um, he is a self-made marine biologist, but an extremely uh, knowledgeable person on all things ocean and specifically the sharks. He was the person that started working with the sharks in the way we do here, so feeding and touching the sharks. And I learned my first skills basically from him. So uh, watching him is, again, I give to him the credit for a continuing or helping me following the passion for sharks, which I had since I was eight years old. Um, what I do in the Bahamas is basically I work with a group of Caribbean reef sharks. Um, it's a tradition, what I call the shark-shaped shark. It shark. Uh, doesn't have weird shape. It's just like long, uh, gray top body, a uh, wide belly, uh, traditional pectoral fins, dorsal fins, and caudal fin. And what I do, I actually uh, feed the sharks. So I go inside uh, this group of sharks and I bring down some food and I feed them. Uh, in front of basically divers and people. And the reason why this was born is because people always wanted to see sharks. Uh, but sharks, opposite of what people believe, are very elusive animals. Uh, it's very hard to go out in the ocean and find sharks. So most divers will be extremely frustrated with, we want to see sharks. And uh, what people used to see was like a, a tail running away from the camera um, as soon as the divers hit the water. So. Uh, food was a little bit of an accident. Um, the company, Unexo, was doing a fish feeding at the time. That basically, this, the sharks showed up, and that's how the shark dive started. Uh, but it's actually the, the way to attract sharks so that people uh, can see them. But the other thing that I do and uh, that I discovered, basically, oh, something happened. Excuse me, sorry. There we go. Um, is actually the um uh, i can actually pet sharks uh sharks do the caribbean reef sharks do come in for allowing me to pet them and while at first it was just a something kind of like we didn't really know what was happening uh we kind of think that they like it uh because it's definitely not a forceful behavior sometimes i have one sometimes two sometimes three uh sharks that come in at any given time and we basically will nudge me with their nose and ask me for uh, basically patting their uh, their face, their their bodies, uh, which is kind of like where all of this started. It's just kind of like, okay, when people start seeing me doing this with sharks, people were like, well, I didn't know sharks do, do, could do that. And so I started using this as a way to uh, connect to people 
and through my connection with sharks, hopefully uh, give them a different idea about the animals. Uh, now, they are sharks and they have uh, rows of teeth and I'm feeding them, so I still wear a protective shark suit because I do believe in knowledge and respect. So um, if I get accidentally bitten when I'm handing out the fish, I want to be protected. But uh, the relationship that I have with these animals is something that I've built through the years. Uh, some of the sharks have been with me nine or ten years. I know each and every one of them. I can recognize them from a distance, from different physical characteristics, and sometimes even uh, display of different behaviors. So they have personalities, they have learning curves, uh, they have different ways of wanting to be touched or not be touched or to approach. So it's very much an interpersonal relationship. So building this interpersonal relationship with the sharks and then sharing it with other people was one of the first things that I, I decided to basically pursue while here. So why sharks? Um, because primarily when you say shark, this is what people try to imagine. Um, you know, maybe some of the new generation don't hear the music, but most people imagine jaws, imagine an emerging animal ready to eat them as soon as they hit the water. And yet if you think about about the millions of people that hit the water every day, and how very, very, very little shark encounters we have. Um, it's very much a, a myth, and it's a mis very, very misinformed myth that is overinflated by media because of the sensationalism that a shark attack may bring. Um, and the reason why this is also shark is because when we say shark, this is, should not be the first image that comes into our mind, that our first image should be that there's over 500 species of sharks. Uh, this one here is one of the smallest species in the world. That's it, that's how big this shark grows. And it's, you know, like a little dwarf lantern shark that fits in the palm of your hand, or the biggest one in the world, the biggest fish in the world that can reach lengths of 50 feet, and yet is a plankton feeder. This is the whale shark. And, and so when we say shark, uh, we we should actually really try to understand it is like saying birds. And that's the reason why that was the first I think It's kind of like, how can we make people understand what really shark means? And it's just this variety of animals with this variety of roles, with this variety of environment. It's just absolutely fascinating. So that was the first reason I decided also to, to basically go for shark besides a personal love for sharks. But sharks are also very much a fundamental link into the food chain of the ocean. They're called what, um, I like to call them cleaners. Even the apex predators, even the biggest sharks that go after the biggest animals like seals and things like that. At the end of the day, uh, they are uh, controllers of the health of the ocean. They eat um, injured fish, they eat uh, slow animals, they eat uh, dead or decaying, so they basically make sure that whatever remains out of their reach is actually the healthy part of the ocean. So they're fundamental into keeping a, a balanced ocean. The thing is we don't really know exactly the extent of the damage that will happen if we lose the sharks. And personally I would not want to know that uh, because I can really tell the difference between places where there are sharks and when there aren't sharks, the difference in the variety of fish, in the cleanliness of the reef, in the health of the corals, just because these animals are there. So I started young, <laughs> very young, like I said, 23 years ago. I was 22 years old and I started from a professional point of view. So what I decided to do is I became a diving instructor and I started working at the Underwater Explorer Society, where I'm still currently am. And I started working with sharks uh, back then. Um, so I made my passion my profession. And this is what made it become what I call shark-centric. So is this was my decision. Is how am I going to help these sharks? Is I like, well, okay, I need to be with them, involved, and I need to be able to speak for them and show something for them. So my way was I'm going to become a scuba diver who can actually educate divers and bring divers to see sharks. So that is the way also I make a living. I go in the water, I feed the sharks, the divers come in, and I share what I 
uh, see and what I experience. So I bring the sharks up to the people uh, to be pets. So they actually encounter uh, what I call my babies. They had an opportunity to touch them. They had an opportunity to see something that maybe it was not so much shown to them before. Uh, you very rarely hear about, you know, oh, these divers can go in the water and pet sharks and swim with sharks and be with sharks. And uh, in the diving world is very common. We almost take that for granted. We're like, yeah, of course you can dive with sharks. But um, all you need to do is to step out a little bit of the diving world. And most people are still very much afraid of the concept of going in the water with sharks. So connection through me to the sharks for the people. Each person that approaches these sharks becomes then a shark ambassador by virtue of having seen and experienced something totally different. And I can see that. I hear that every day. And so I have people coming in from all over the world um, that want to learn this and they want to do what I do. And so I teach that as well. So I bring people in the water and they wear the suit and they basically come in the water and learn to do what I do, so then they can become ambassadors in their, in their own country. This is Heba, she comes from Kuwait, which is a pretty amazing. I have students that come from all over the world. Again, creating shark ambassadors uh, through direct contact. So they come down and learn to do uh, what I do. Um, and this is also to take away what I call anthropomorphic interpretation of sharks. So giving sharks uh, human connotations. Um, it's me weak. So we, we talk about sharks, we say oh, it's a vicious attack or it's, you know, it's an aggressive behavior. But we, we need to start thinking about sharks as sharks. So when, when a shark um, will latch on to a fish and basically shake the head from side to side to take a chunk out of the fish, it's not vicious nor aggressive. That is how the animal is designed to eat. So um, let's bring the sharks back to be sharks rather than animals with human behaviors. Uh, let's have everybody immersed with these animals and understand. And again, that's the reason why I wear the chain suit, is an understanding and respect of the nature of these animals. But it's also pretty amazing seeing, I can be in the middle of them with a fish in my hands and they're all gonna swim around me. Nobody really is gonna try to, to bite me. The chain suit is like a bike helmet. You're there just in case of a fall. Um, and to demonstrate that, what I do is I also go free diving and scuba diving with them uh, without any protection. Uh, because again, that's a, a very not a concept. It's like, oh, you feed sharks and you teach them to eat people, which is uh, not very true. Um, sharks have seven senses and they've learned to follow humans and their boats from the first day. I do believe the first day we put a kayak in the water and started to fish. The sharks knew where to go to get the, the scraps. They've associated humans and boats with food for centuries since we basically crossed the first time any uh, body of water where the shark was in. Um, but because of their seven senses, they're capable of discerning when we have food and when we don't have food. So I also do this just to show uh, people the difference. And I like to help sharks. So one of the things I do I, when I go diving with them, I actually remove hooks. Uh, these are some of the hooks that are removed uh, from the mouth of my babies uh, through the years. Uh, this is a fairly old picture. I do believe there's another maybe 30 or 40 hooks in them. And some of them, yes, it will rust away or go away, but quite a lot of them are fairly big and remain in for a long time. And I can see how the sharks struggle to eat. Uh, so this is an indirect effect of my work with them. Um, so this is like a big part. When I go down feeding them, I also try uh, to remove hooks. Um, and then this message has, has come up and has gone uh, far away. This is a picture from a TV program that I did uh, for China. Uh, China being one of the biggest consumer of shark fin soup um, is also one of those countries that uh, is very much misunderstood. Again, I very much like to understand how people you know, think and, and work, and they very much love sharks. And some people, we need to understand, they don't know what they don't know. So if we don't tell them where shark fin soup comes from and what damage it's doing, uh, maybe the consumer, they don't really think about what the consequences of their actions is. Um, 
this is a young lady that came from India. So like these countries that has large population with a high consumptions of marine life. Uh, this gentleman comes from Singapore. He works in an aquarium. Big spoke person now for sharks. He's been on uh, many TV programs and many uh, presentations and articles about not consuming sharks, not fishing sharks, and Singapore being one of you know the core countries of uh, shark, basically shark fins, where they come in and out of the harbor. So uh, the message comes from below the water and through the images in the video and then direct contact. Now is a spreading around the world. I also um, tried to help in the past scientists uh, with like direct work, like collecting DNA, like in this picture. So uh, young people that want to come in and want to learn how to study sharks and how to work with sharks, we try to use these relax the state of the sharks to be more non-intrusive uh, type of uh, work. And then a lot of these people develop, again, uh, professions into wanting to be working and protecting sharks. Um, part of my work is also very much educational. So a couple of years ago, uh, through all my courses and everything that I've done through the years, I decided also to become a course director, a PADI course director. Uh, that basically is the a person that teaches people um, how to teach. So I'm an instructor trainer. So I teach people how to teach and I teach them about scuba diving and ocean conservation and all of that. And so I, I put this, uh, this uh, teaching uh, love that I have and sharing uh, to use as much as I can, primarily on the island where I am, at Unexo. Uh, we have uh, different school programs. We support all sorts of like local uh, snorkeling and scuba diving. Uh, we try to educate Bahamians and keep them into uh, the business of becoming diving professionals. And um, from diving professional, then they'll go into different fields like uh, um, hotel directors, water sports managers, even police force, other educators. So uh, through the years, we've basically seen these young people uh, from 12th grade on just develop and turning. There's uh, so many um, in so many different professions and it's one of the most beautiful things that uh, basic, my profession allows me to do is to share this teaching, this growing uh, inside the country. So these Bahamians now develop a, a love and pride for their animals, for their oceans, for their, um, for their beaches. Today is World Ocean Day and the entire team without me, because I'm here on Google Hangout, is actually doing a cleanup. Uh, a cleanup because they do understand, you know, also how everything is tied in uh, with garbage. So we do quite a lot of beach cleanup. This is from a couple of years ago. Like I said, today I'm busy here, so I can be with them. Um, we also host a different um, project. This was actually an island project. It was basically students, art students, and this is the garbage collected off the beach in like one day, one walk, and they came in and basically created art. And as I'm speaking with you, I also like to go and speak to local schools and uh, children and share what I know about sharks, answer questions. You'd be surprised how many misconceptions even these young people have about sharks. And so just go and share, and this is one of the other Google Hangouts from uh, maybe a couple of years back or a year back. So again, bringing what I see on the water up on the surface and sharing it with people uh, directly here at Unexo or even through basically speaking. And then I get invited to speak about sharks. So I very much go to different conferences and uh, different presentation from dive shows to aquariums to universities and again, share all of this that I've learned about sharks through the years. Um, I participate in campaigns like this one was done by Shark Savers and WWF is I'm finished with fins campaign is about basically representing not wanting to consume shark fins. So it was a big campaign about also talking about where shark fins come from. Um, and then hosting uh, also scholars from our world and the water scholarship society. So very much a wide array of reaching, but uh, still basically uh, above and below the water. 
Uh, and yes, all of this, all this work that, that we do also stretches beyond just the shark. That's why I'm shark centric. But if the sharks is the real, is the core motivation. But then we look around, we're like, wait a minute, everything is collect, it connected. So that's the reason why we collect garbage and do beach cleanup. And for example, we actually, uh, UNEXO, put in all the moorings on our south shore so that any boater out there that want to go diving does not anchor. They actually tied up to the moorings and we just do all of this out of our own pocket. We basically uh, put in the moorings and there's no more anchoring on the reef. Again, another way to save and to protect the environment where sharks come from. A personal, more personal uh, work that I do on the side, although I'm a cave diving instructor, is I work very much in the underwater caves of the Bahamas, like Jordan was saying, I've been on part of also Net Geo exploration team. And uh, uh, the Bahamas, this is underneath uh, one of the islands in the Bahamas, have this beautiful reservoir of fresh water. And inside this fresh water is these uh, phenomenal caves. And, and again, it's like, well, what does cave diving has to do with sharks? And, and it's actually quite a lot. Uh, one, these caves are the reservoir of fresh water. So the garbage collection and cleaning has a lot to do also with our fresh water supply. Uh, but the caves are also very much connected with the mangroves. And the islands of the Bahamas were, in a certain way, in a sense, very fortunate. There is a many, many, many islands and keys that are not developed and they have these beautiful uh, mangrove forests. And the mangroves are like these basic nursery grounds for everything and anything from corals to sponges to uh, small fishes and to oh, baby sharks. A lot of species of sharks use the mangroves to reproduce to leave their babies there till they grow big enough to come out in the oceans. The mangroves themselves are water filters and water cleaners and land protectors. And the caves are basically linked into the mangroves. So where the caves go, there's gonna be mangroves. If we have a cave and we protect it, we protect the mangroves, we protect the oceans, we protect the nursery grounds of all these environments. Um, and one of my uh, most beautiful projects and that I'm very proud of is the Bahamas National Trust that proved in 2015 the expansion of the Lucaya National Park over the entire cave, which I uh, mapped uh, together with the help of uh, a buddy and friend, Arik Purse. And uh, they basically said, yeah, it's true, we shouldn't just protect the entrance, we need to protect the entire cave and everything that is related with it. So the government stepped in and said, oh, wow, definitely we need to protect uh, mangroves and caves and sharks. Uh, sharks are protected in the Bahamas since 2011, thanks to the cooperative work of the Bahamas National Trust, Pew, and a little bit of my input. And uh, they're protected from everything, import, export, lending, exchange, commerce. So um, we are very much have a government that understand the connection in nature and the connection between sharks, uh, between land, between mangroves, between uh, caves and all of that. Because this is unfortunately the reality in some parts of the world. This is how sharks are uh, decimated on, you know, on, on a world scale in, in certain places without protection. Um, but this is more or less actually how we have sharks here in the Bahamas. And not only on, on my island, and we are in the Bahamas, there's many, many dive operators that do act and interact with sharks with the best interest of sharks in their heart and to portray a different image and basically protect them and have a healthy ocean. I'm going to exit. Stop sharing. Here we go. You know, thank you for being here. We appreciate how you're talking about the combination of conservation, the importance of sustainability, but also the education stuff that you bring into the field is also amazing. And I think there's so many healthy changes there. We have 
five minutes left, and I would like to invite each class to ask a quick question. I'm going to start with Miss Graham's class. If you're ready, um, send someone up to the camera, get nice and close. I'm going to turn on your mic now. One question for you guys. Oh, sorry. You don't have right. okay. uh, Go up to the camera. Um, oh. Um, uh, what? Is it like, do I just ask somebody? Oh, okay. Um, uh, have you ever worked with any other sharks besides uh, the reef sharks or? Um, have yes, you I have. Yeah. I actually travel quite a lot the world. It, the presentation was a little bit short because of the time, but I've been in many places in the world and I met with other people that work with other sharks to learn from them. So I worked with bull sharks in Fiji and here in the Bahamas, tiger sharks, lemons, Blue Makos, I've been in cage diving with great whites in South Africa. I'm trying to think, uh, I've, um, those are more of the sharks that I have found in nurse sharks, black tips, white tips, summerheads. Those are some of the sharks I worked with, physically worked with. Great, that's a nice spread. And moving on to Ms. Zadrozny's class, do you guys have a question? I'm turning your mic on now. Yep. Chelsea, move right there you go. Where are the different places that you traveled to train to go to see different sharks? Where? Where are different places you went to go see different sharks? Okay. okay, so it's a little bit similar. It's the same place. Basically, I've been in Fiji. I've been in Rhode Island. I've been in uh, uh, California. I've been in South Africa. Um, I've been in Mexico. Um, I've been several places around the Bahamas because we have different species right here in the Bahamas. So, so uh, those are more or less the places where I've been. And Singapore and the aquarium and all of that with some species. Great question for Ms. Dronsny's class. Um, next up is Ms. Mayling's class. Do you guys have a question? I'm turning on your mic now. When you're in the water, do you feel like you're in a different world? No, I feel like, like I'm in my world. When I'm on the land, I feel I'm in a different world. Great question and great answer. Um, our next class, Ms. Kaiser, I'm going to turn on your microphone now. <coughs> Hi, my name is John. I am part of the debate team in fifth grade here at Freehold, New Jersey. One of the topics I'm doing is whether we should protect humans from sharks or sharks from humans. So whose fault is it when a shark attacks? Whose fault? Is that a fault or is it just a circumstance? That the thing is with sharks is we are in the water and the sharks can't come out of the water. So if you want to say it's a fault, well, it's a human. <laughs> we shouldn't be there. Uh, the concept is understanding when to be in the water and when not. There's very uh, certain instances where, yes, it could be potentially dangerous to be in the water. We have Verify dust, dawn, night, around people fishing. That would not be a good idea. Uh, murky waters and things like that. If sharks are gathering to eat on fish, maybe we shouldn't go swimming in, in the middle of the fish. Uh, but in general, it's more a wrong place or wrong time. So it's just a matter of understanding a little bit more about where I am and what I'm doing, what kind of sharks are here and if it's okay to be in the water or not. 99% of the time it's gonna be okay. Awesome, thank you for that thoughtful answer. And to all the classes, those were amazing, really good questions. I appreciate your analysis and your thoughts. Um, that's the end of this Hangout. For those of you who are watching on YouTube Live, joining us not in this Hangout, but on YouTube, I appreciate you guys joined us. And for everyone out there that's watching, including the classrooms that are currently here right now, I want to say happy World Ocean Day, and we've got other hangouts going on throughout the day, so please check us out at the National Geographic Education YouTube page. And I'm going to turn on all the microphones now, and we can all say bye to Christina and give her a big thank you. The microphone is for all of you. For classroom, we are, that's all for us. We're going offline now. Thanks for joining. <laughs>